the average person on earth in this day and age is very much familiar with worry. Almost everything is a cause for worry. Security, finances, family, health, politics, businesses, social media, and many more. Men and women, young and old alike, continue to fight with frustrations, depression, and fear every day. Some succeed in overcoming this while some do not. Sadly, many people end their own lives because of these things, without the chance to find out an escape, without the chance to fulfill their God-ordained destinies. Today, they are here, and tomorrow, they are no more. However, if God has made it possible for you to come across this message today, then please, I encourage you to consider these words as His words to your heart and for your situation. I need you to please remember and understand that nowhere in the Bible did God promise us a life without stress and diverse challenges. In fact, the Bible constantly reminds us that those who believe and are following Christ will suffer persecutions and challenges. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why do bad things happen to good people? Yes, I've caught myself asking that question before. I look around, and it seems the good has it bad, and the bad ones have it going perfectly well for them. Things are going great for them. Their businesses look great. Their marriages seem to work quite well. Their kids live and look healthy. Their evil is well known by everyone, and yet their lives seem perfect. On the one hand is a guy who loves God and does good in his community. He is so passionate about the things of God. He shares the gospel with his neighbors, visits and prays for the sick and the weak. He gives what he can and is always there to encourage others. However, despite being qualified, this person may struggle to find work. This same guy may struggle to pay on his mortgage. This same person may struggle in his marriage. This same person may be the one who's always dealing with one issue after another in his life. Now hear me, dear saints. I am not pointing these things out so that you begin to question your faith or God himself. I'm pointing it out to you so that you can know that these things are events and not you. In Psalms chapter 34, verse 19, the Bible says, The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him for them all. You see, one of the biggest causes of worry for the believer is arriving at the negative conclusion that something is wrong with you, or you are doing something wrong and so God is punishing you for it. It is true that sometimes a person can give the enemy an opportunity to come into his life or her life to wreak havoc. Still, this is not always the case, and even if it is, you are not hopeless at all. You see, the Bible does say that situations that are like fire will arise in your life. Situations that leave people burned out. Situations that consume everything in and around the lives of people and leave them with nothing. It also talks about situations that are like water too. These are situations in which you feel like you're drowning, as if you can't take it anymore. These situations overwhelm you on every side, sapping the strength out of you taking you deeper the more you struggle with them, leaving you weakened and unmotivated. These situations I just referenced may be familiar to you, and you may still be wondering, what is he trying to see? Well, I've said all those things to say this. Whether you are going through fire or you are going through water right now, worry no more. Here is God telling you that he will always stand with you. God will always stand with you. Why? Because he has everything under control, including the worst of everything. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. From the day you became a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, his son, you became a member of God's family, and thus you became God's responsibility. From that day, your business became God's business, 
Your finances became God's finances. Your education became His responsibility. Your health became His care. In fact, everything about you became His. And here is what He says about anything that may think about touching you. Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8. For this is what the Lord Almighty says, After the Glorious One has sent me against the nations that have plundered you, for whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. Dear Saint, this is God that says that you are the apple of his eye. You have become that special to him. So God says that you are special to him. You are his responsibility. He is your father. Also, he has said that being his child won't mean that days of trouble won't come. However, being his child means that when the troubles come, you won't go through them alone. Look, there is nothing positive about worry. It's okay for a person to put their minds to work, think things through, weigh the pros and cons. However, to let this thinking to get to the point where it steals away your peace and your joy means you have stepped from mere mind exercise into worry. You must understand that worry is a waster and a destroyer. There's a saying that goes, worry keeps you busy, but gets you nowhere. A very true statement. When then are you worried, dear child of God? Why are you panicking when your God is on your side? I love what Jesus told his disciples when he noticed they had begun to worry concerning his departure and were downcast. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. One translation says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have trouble and suffering, but take courage, I have conquered the world. Take heart, take courage, have hope. Would you be concerned if your landlord called to inform you that someone else had paid your rent on your behalf so you didn't have to pay anymore? Would you worry if your creditor called to tell you all your debts had been paid because a famous rich man agreed to pay for you? I am sure you wouldn't. Why? Because the evidences are right before you. Your needs had been met. The shame had been covered. However, do you know that the monarch of the universe has paid everything on your behalf in order for you to have peace? The Bible says that the chastisement that would give us peace was laid upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He has done it all, my friend. And not only so, he is with you right now. You worry because you think that you are alone, but I am here to tell you that you aren't. You are scared because all you see is how there's no help for you from anyone. But don't forget that true elevation and deliverance comes from one, and that is God. David said in Psalms chapter 75, verse six through seven, no one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. It's time to look up, dear child of God. That is where your help is. Your worry is the outcome of where your attention is. But it is time for you to look up. David told us where to look, not down on yourself. When you look at yourself, you will find many reasons to worry. You will find many reasons to be cast down. You will find many reasons to feel unqualified. You will find many reasons to fear. He doesn't say to look at anyone else either, because when you look at people, you may see disappointment and invariably another reason to worry and fear. When you look at people, you may see pain and danger and thus another reason to worry and fear. Psalms chapter 121 verses one through two. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The help is not in the amount of your bank account. That's not where your attention should be. That help is not in what you have or don't have. It is up, and by up I mean God, not the sky or the clouds. There is a place above your reasons, above your pains, and above your fears. That is where God is. That is where your help is. That is where peace is. That is where healing is. Everything you need is there. When you look up, my friend, you will find out that he has been with you the whole time through the storms. 
through the ups and downs, but your worry has kept you from believing or calling on Him and thus limited Him from revealing Himself in your life. Don't let worry drive your life anymore. Don't let the worry drive you to make decisions that will cost you more tomorrow. Don't let your worries give birth to impatience and desperation. Rather, turn your worries into praise. Why praise? Because God is in control. There's nothing beyond God's control. Nothing takes Him by surprise and there is nothing too hard for Him to do. I don't have all the answers, but I know just one thing about those who choose to acknowledge God with them and focus on Him. They are never down. They are the ones that come out triumphant from depression and frustration. They are the ones that see the light in the darkness and keep moving until they come into it. Psalms chapter 34 verse 5, those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. They are the ones whose shame are turned to honor and testimonies. These are they that know their God. These are the ones who have opened themselves up to believe in what the Word says than in what the news channels are saying. They are the ones who dare to agree with what the Word says than in what the bank account is saying. One move from God can change your situation right now. Dare to believe. Throw worry out the window, my friend. God will always, always stand with you no matter what. And don't forget, nothing happening to you is beyond His control. He's got you, now and always. Let it go and rest in Him today. In a society torn apart by religiously motivated violence, where walls of enmity are built between us, and where religious extremists, egotistical and fleshy aspirations tear the world apart, we can do no better than to return to Jesus' life and work. There is no higher example for Christians than Jesus, the Prince of Peace. True peace comes from building a healthy relationship with God for Christians. For followers of Jesus, however, finding peace comes from the person and activity of Jesus himself. In Christ Jesus, May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds. For He Himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside His flesh, the law, with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in Himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. Ephesians 2, 14-17 It's easier said than done to find peace. It's difficult to be at peace when you're coping with work stress, strained relationships, financial hardship, or any other challenge that comes your way. And if you're up against multiple challenges, it's understandable that it feels like too much for one person to handle. That is when the Bible can be used to help you overcome any difficulties you may face in life. Many Bible verses regarding peace emphasize the Lord's profound desire for His people and the world in general to understand what true peace, happiness, and pleasure are, especially in times of adversity. Take a step back, breathe, and open yourself to God when you're feeling overwhelmed and struggle to find the serenity you so much desire in your life. He has repeatedly demonstrated that He is primarily concerned with bringing everyone comfort. Jesus brought peace by the blood of His crucifixion, reads Colossians 1, verse 20. And His death demonstrated to God's people the importance of believing in something greater than themselves. Keep in mind the blessings that God has in store for you. 
God offers a solution to each problem you may be facing. He has the light for us, even on the darkest days. It's all laid out for you in the Bible. Just like Christ was the only one through whom all things were formed by his mighty power, in the original creation, which was ruined by sin, so also is Christ Jesus the one through whom the new creation is formed and made. And through the same Lord Jesus Christ, God will make peace with everything in heaven and on earth, through Christ's blood on the cross. All of God's fullness lives in Him. All of His righteousness, His merit, life, all of His grace. And all we can do is rejoice in these mysteries of the truth that have been revealed to us through faith. Finding peace in difficult times addresses the broad and growing demand for attention management skills and the ability to live life on your own terms in our fast-paced modern existence. The Bible teaches us to build deep supplies of resilience for the difficult circumstances we are currently experiencing. Overwhelming mental, physical, and emotional states, as well as distraction, technology addiction, sleep deprivation, information overload, and the inability to switch off are all symptoms of the modern age. The good news is that God has promised to be with us throughout our problems, so you won't have to suffer alone. He is always present in both good and bad situations. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 what a reassuring promise Moses made to Joshua and the entire nation of Israel. And this is a promise from the Lord that applies equally to Christians in today's church dispensation as it did to Israel during the Torah dispensation. Just as he promised Israel, the Lord has vowed to go before us. He is pledged to always be with us. What a relief to know that he would never abandon or fail us. As God's people, the Lord promised to bless their faithfulness while also warning that any unfaithfulness would be punished. Promises of blessing in exchange for obedience and warnings of curses in exchange for disobedience had nothing to do with salvation, but everything to do with victory and future rewards. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, God's word must be trusted. He is concerned about us. He has assured us that we need to be afraid. Every moment of the day, he is with us. Even when we let him down, he has vowed to go ahead of us, to lead us, and to prepare the path we travel. He has vowed to accompany us on our journey through life and to be with us through all of life's difficulties, even when we fail to be faithful. God has promised that He will never abandon us and that one day He will take us to be with Him forever. God's Word can be relied upon. God's Word is just as trustworthy now as it was in Moses' day. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, verse 13. Because of everything He is to us, everything He has done for us, everything He is doing for us as we journey through life, and everything He has promised to us in the days ahead, we have the abundant, and unfathomable peace of God within us, as well as the magnificent hope that is ours in Christ. What a wonderful blessing it is to put our trust in God. May we be encouraged to broaden our view of our magnificent God of hope and to set our hopes on Him who has already bestowed every spiritual benefit on us 
in heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus our Lord. May we continue to put our faith in His infallible Word and live in a way that honors His holy name. We should find peace in Christ Jesus, God's only begotten Son, whom the Father sent to us. In this troubled world, we can find comfort in Him. We should put our faith in His good guidance rather than our own thinking. Nothing can separate us from our wonderful God of hope, not even the numerous difficulties of this life or the painful circumstances that we all experience. Because we are safe in Jesus' embrace, neither the old sin nature's ravages nor the temptations of the enemy who seeks our ruin can separate us from God's love or take away our hope in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 28 through 29. Millions of distressed Christians have found solace in our Lord's amazing words. God does not promise an easy life, but for those who have tried to carry their own burdens and earn their own salvation, it is like water to a thirsty man in the desert. Jesus observed humanity being oppressed and powerless. His pastor's sheep were thirsty for living water. He will take us to a quiet spot near still waters for a refreshing drink. He is continually urging us to join him on his journey. He will continue to walk diligently. It is up to us to decide whether or not we will respond and follow. His invitation also includes a call to die to ourselves, to trade everything we own, and to be reborn. Weary and burdened is an apt description of the situation of men and women on the planet, especially in today's frantic world. Every aspect of our lives presents us with obstacles, from studies to family, to finances, to health, to mental, the list goes on and on. In other words, problems are inexhaustible. The Savior calls us to come to a halt and rest in Him. Your salvation is in repentance and repose, in stillness and faith is your strength. Isaiah 30, 15 states, but you would have none of it. How difficult is it for us in our flesh to do the one thing that would be the easiest, simply trust Him and cast our cares on Him. People who are exhausted and weary are invited to come to Jesus. These are people who are exhausted as a result of their challenging job. They're also fatigued from accomplishing things on their own and with their own strength. Maybe they were prioritizing the wrong things. Perhaps they have a misunderstanding about what God expects of them. Perhaps they've been doing things incorrectly. Jesus wants us to come to Him and continue to learn from Him. If we let Him, He will equip, instruct, and guide us to be effective in life and service. Jesus says that if we come to Him and do things His way, in partnership and communion with Him, we shall find rest. Make God your refuge and beg Him for the strength you'll need each minute of the day. God is with us. He is always present and He is our ally. God is in charge. He is not surprised. He is unchanging and He can be trusted. Take these psalms' words and images and pray with them. When concern threatens to consume your thoughts, pray for God's strength and seek refuge in Him. Imagine God wrapping His loving arms around you like a mother hen does, over and over her brood. The world as we know it is no longer the same, yet God is the same. 
He will assist you if you ask for it and ask him to manifest himself in your heart and head. Psalm 46 is the answer to our concerns, our worries, and our needs. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Psalms 46, verse 1. Man is born unto trouble. Job shouted in Job 5, verse 7. In the middle of his vexing anguish, trouble can strike for a variety of reasons and in a variety of forms. But whatever your problem is, don't give up. Don't succumb to despair. In your hour of need, God offers to be everything you need. You don't have to go through life alone. You do not have to carry your weight alone. Please come to Jesus. He will be a safe haven, a source of strength, and a source of assistance for you. Does it always feel like you are where God wants you to be? Does life always give you that signal that you're standing on good ground? Should I be honest with you? It doesn't. That's right. It's not every day you wake up feeling all right. It's not every day you wake up feeling like everything's going great with your life. There are days, in fact, when you might wake up and after looking around, you feel like there's just something off with your life. This is the reason some people seek validations from different sources, like partying, getting drunk, drugs, harmful adventures, and a whole lot of other things. In fact, I've seen people pick up projects not because they honestly love their jobs or the people they're serving, but because they think that by doing this service, people will like them, and they will feel good about themselves. Some people might help others not because they're kind at heart, but because they find validation from the gratitude of others. It makes them feel loved. It makes them believe they're on the right path. However, no matter the validation of others, you must remember this. If you're not standing where God wants you to stand, it won't make any difference. Where's the best place to stand in life? What does it mean to be right where God wants you to be? How can you find this place? Psalms 37.23 shows us. It says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Here is how it starts. Righteousness. You may have overlooked this word before, but you shouldn't. Why is that, you may be asking. You see, righteousness is not the working of man. It's the working of God. It's not the attribute of man. It's the attribute of God. God is righteous, and man is unrighteous. This righteousness is a state of being that qualifies one to know, do, and be right. In this state, right is not just a thing, but also a being. You know that when we say God is right, we aren't just saying He does what's right. We're also saying that He represents righteousness. He is righteousness personified. Hence, He cannot be condemned. He is justified in all things. When you now look at the Bible in the New Testament, God decided to share His righteousness with humanity. In this He did through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus. The work of redemption was not only to save you and me from the grip of sin or from the power of the devil, but also to bestow God's divine ability to be right upon us. Hence, whoever puts their faith in Jesus is translated from damnation to justification and from a condemned race to a race that has a right standing with God. Now, you and I are on God's side. We stand on the same ground. Where do you stand now? You stand in Christ. Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Romans 5, 1-2 Therefore, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace, in which we now stand. 
and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Jesus is our platform. Through him we have access. Through him we can come to God without fear, shame, or guilt consciousness. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. This is the beginning of being rightly positioned in life. If you get everything else wrong in life, don't get this one wrong. If you get everything else in life and fail to position here, you have missed it all. This positioning in Christ is the start of God's great manifestation in your life, which was prepared before time began. Everything else in your life that will birth your testimonies and miracles start from here. But why did I have to start with all this narrative? I needed you to realize that just like righteousness, being where God wants you to be in life is something you validate not by your feelings, but by faith. You are not declared righteous because of what you've done or said, but because your faith in what God has done and said. Two verses point this out clearly. Romans 4, 9. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 concludes it thus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Remember also that God's word is truth, the whole truth. There's no argument with what God's word has said. The only problem is that many times we seem to hear more of what people are saying than what God's already said and is still saying. Maybe you're listening to the culture around you that cancels everything that isn't logical to them. And you're thinking, am I wasting my time still trusting in God? I'm here to tell you, dear friend, that you aren't wasting your time. I'm here to tell you that within God, a life yielded to Him is at the right place. No matter what you may be seeing in your life right now, as long as you're walking in obedience and faith, the Word of God, being led by the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, you're exactly where God wants you to be. Maybe God asked you to start a venture, to relocate to a new location, to apply for a particular project or any other thing, and you obeyed. The fact that your life is under such divine influence, the fact that you're intentional about pleasing God, the fact that you put God first before yourself or before others, you're right where he wants you to be. Listen, Obedience does not take you or place you where you want to be. It places you where God wants you to be. And where God plants you is the right place to be. It may not look like it right now, but keep standing firm. As I share these words with you, I'm also reminded to keep standing firm. I also have times in my life when I feel like something's wrong. But after checking myself and spending time with God, I realize that this is the voice of the devil trying to weaken my faith and make me go after unworthy alternatives. Keep standing firm. The fact that things are going well may not mean that God is there. And the fact that things are going rough may not mean that God's not there with you either. Remember that Jesus once instructed his disciples to sail to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. They obeyed him. But in the middle of their journey, a great storm rose against them. Jesus was sleeping in the stern of the boat while the storm was raging. It didn't say that there was no storm because Jesus was there. It said that there was a storm even though Jesus was there. The disciples tried all they could to keep the boat from sinking, but were failing. Then they called on Jesus, waking him up from his sleep. When Jesus got up, he rebuked the wind and it ceased. Everything became calm by his command. Another time, Paul the Apostle received a vision to go into a city to go preach the gospel there. This was confirmed that God was directing him. But on arriving there, they met trouble and were arrested. It was in the prison that Paul and Silas praised God. And God descended into that prison cell 
causing an earthquake that set all the prisoners free, resulting in the salvation of the jailer and his family. What can we learn from these stories? Jesus dwells in you through the Holy Spirit. You are now the righteousness of God in him. Now you live for God. You live the way he wants you to and not the way the culture or system of this world wants. Your obedience to God at your job, relationships, home, and so on are the demonstrations of your standing with God. In this wonderful position in Christ, many things will happen. A lot of them will happen to test your resolve, to see if you're truly convinced of this thing, to push you off your feet, to push you to the wall, to show you that it's not worth your sacrifice and that there's nothing to show for this path you've chosen to follow God on. However, consider these words to be the words of God to your heart today. You are right where God wants you to be. Keep standing firm. In the face of those pressures to do what everyone else is doing, keep standing firm. In the face of the pressures to compromise your faith, keep standing firm. In the midst of circumstances that want to draw you into alternatives, keep standing firm. I encourage you to consider the kind of conviction that the servant of God, Apostle Paul, must have had for him to say the words he told the young man Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 12. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Do you know the God that you believe? Do not forget who he is. He's God, and besides him, there is no other. He's alive, he's real, he never fails. Even in your mess, he's still coming for you. His love continues to chase after you, even when you don't have strength in yourself. So long as you give God the opportunity to be your God, he will show up. You just keep standing firm. Hold on to the promises found in his word, just like Abraham. Keep reminding yourself that if there's anyone worth trusting, it's God. If there's anyone worth waiting for, it is God. If there was anyone whose words were worth believing, it's God. I dare you to trust in the integrity of God today. Keep standing in his words. Your life may not look like it right now. Your results may not look like it right now. However, rejoice, my friend. God is on your side. You are in him through your faith and obedience to Jesus. As a result, you are right where he wants you to be. Keep hanging in there. It will never remain this way. Change is coming. Don't give up on God, because he's not done with you just yet. Luke 5.16 But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus was almost always surrounded by people, but having some time alone with God was important to him. He made sure he found time to be alone with the Father. He often withdrew from the crowds or went to the mountainside to pray. He even spent 40 days in the wilderness alone, praying and fasting. You see, we all need to create time to be alone with God. In our walk of faith, we need to constantly go back to God in quietness not only because he requires it of us, but because it's good for us. It strengthens our spirit man. God wants to find a way to shut out everything and everyone so that we can spend time in prayer and reading his word. It's true that for some, being alone with God is easier than it is for others. Our differences in personality make it easier or more difficult to dedicate time alone with God. Your personality may be naturally more comfortable being alone. You don't really need people around you, and you're happier that way. For others, being alone can be difficult. It may feel lonely, uncomfortable, 
and even awkward because your personality comes alive when you're around people. But whether you like having people around you or you don't, God wants all of us to make time to be alone with Him. Away from the demands of life, away from the noise and the clamor, away from the many voices of people's opinions and advice, away from peer pressure and social pressures. You see, being alone with God is the only way your spirit man will be rejuvenated and refreshed, right in God's presence. If your faith is low, get some alone time with God and He will fill you with more faith. If you're feeling tired and weary in your spirit, get some alone time in God's presence and He will revive you. Do you have some important decision to make and you need God's guidance? Spend time alone listening for His voice and God will speak to you. Time alone with God is a time when God reveals Himself to you. He says in Jeremiah 29, 13, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Seeking Him with all your heart means that your heart is devoted to God and your mind is giving undivided attention to the one who is king of your heart. It means that you have placed the maker of the universe as the priority. It means that God is above your work, family, friends, or even church. Sometimes we're doing all these activities at church, but we're not spending time with the one that we go to worship at church. When you're committed to being alone with God, then and only then do you find Him. And I'm not talking about being alone because you're running away from a situation or avoiding responsibility. I'm not talking about being alone because you think you're better than your brother or because you think you're too good to mingle with others. I'm not talking about being alone because you're depressed. No, if you're depressed, by all means, find a way to get help. Find counsel. Find someone to pray with you and walk with you in those dark times. I'm talking about being alone so you can spend time with God. Find time once every day even many times in a day. Take that time away from people and away from all you're doing to seek God's face. Before you choose your spouse or buy that house, before you change jobs or buy that care, in whatever you're doing, take time alone with God so that He will direct your path. You'll waste less time making mistakes and or doing things that God hasn't even called you to do. Before Jesus chose his 12 disciples, he went away to pray. Before he began his ministry, he took 40 days alone to pray and fast before he was crucified. He took time alone with God so he could be strengthened from inside. If you're looking for clarity on a situation in your life, some time alone may be the only way you'll get to understand what God wants for you or from you. But we live in a time where we don't know how to be alone. Even when we're attempting to be alone or acting like we're alone, we're taking selfies of everything we're doing and posting them on social media. You take a photo of yourself praying, hashtag prayer time. You take a photo of yourself taking breakfast, hashtag having some alone breakfast time. You're alone, but busy posting everything on social media and checking your phone, hoping other people will like your post or comment on your post. That's not being alone with God. That's being lonely. That's looking for attention in areas of your life where it's not necessary. You're looking for love on social media, and when it doesn't come, you feel even more lonely. Don't get me wrong. It's not entirely wrong to post your activities on social media. Sometimes that ministers to someone out there. But if you're doing it for attention or love, then those are the wrong reasons and is a sign that you're lonely. Being alone with God might mean no gadgets, no posting on social media, no texting, no taking photos, no phone calls, none of that. It means that you shut the door and get into the prayer closet where it's just you and God spending time together. It's about communing with God and spending time to prioritize God, to read and understand His Word. It's that place where nobody but God can hear your cry when all other voices are shut out and all you're longing for, all you're listening to, is the voice of the Almighty God. Interestingly, 
God also wants to be alone sometimes, simply just to rest. Yes, rest. Mark 6.31 Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. In the world we live in today, we glorify being busy. We're moving from one meeting to another, one business deal to another, one function to another. But God says in Psalm 103, 14, For He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. God knows that we are but flesh. He knows that without rest, our bodies will get weak and sick. God knows that when your body doesn't have rest, it cannot function as He wants it to. That's why Jesus took time away from the crowd after ministering to them. He needed time with the Father where He could rejuvenate by spending time with God alone. Time alone with God is a way of calming our hearts and minds so we can get proper rest. Time alone with God has a way of filling us with His joy and peace. Time with God alone energizes us to continue with our life's purpose. The most difficult reason and season when God wants you to be alone is when He separates us from all that we know, from all that is familiar to us. In times like these, God is preparing us for an assignment. You find yourself thinking differently and viewing life from a different perspective. God uses these moments of being alone to prepare us for where He's taking us and for how He wants to use us. These are times when you might have people around you, but you still feel alone because you're in a season of separation and sanctification. In these seasons where you feel alone, He teaches us lessons that make us bolder, that help us to recognize His voice and to stop relying on people's opinions. You see, you can never really make a difference for God if you're too concerned with what people think about you. To boldly be God's voice in your generation, you have to be a person that is not concerned with pleasing people. Being alone with God has a way of teaching you to fully rely on God, to fully depend on Him for love, affirmation, and identity. Many servants of God recorded in the Bible went through seasons of being alone. God allowed them to be alone so that He could prepare them for their destiny. Look at Joseph who was sold off as a slave by his brothers. I'm sure it was a dark time for Joseph, a time when he felt betrayed, alone, and deserted. But God allowed it and used this opportunity to create a path that would see Joseph become a great leader who saved the life of his family and country from famine. When we look at the life of Moses, he was living a happy life in the palace, enjoying all the benefits of being the child of Pharaoh's daughter but he was forced to run away to Midian, away from everything he had ever known, from family and friends, so that he could escape a death penalty for killing an Egyptian. I can only imagine that this was a very dark period in his life. And though he found a wife and family while in Midian, he had to stay away from his first home for many years. But in this season of separation and of being away from the place he had called home, God revealed himself to Moses spoke to him, and used him to set the children of Israel free. There are situations where you may find that God lovingly orchestrates things so that you will find yourself without friends, sometimes without family around you. He may allow circumstances in your life that separate you from others so that He can prepare you for your destiny. God will also not share His glory with anyone. He sometimes wants us alone as a way of prioritizing Him, as a way of saying, Above all else, Lord, you matter the most to me. And haven't we all at one time or another made other things our idols, made money our God, made relationships with men more important than our relationship with God? God will not share his position with another thing or person, and he wants you alone with him, separate from people and things. In this place where he has all your attention, he will sanctify you and make you his own. Exodus 34, 14. Do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. When you feel that you're alone, that everyone is abandoning you, don't be afraid, don't worry, don't despair. The Lord knows why He wants you alone, 
and when it's all said and done, He will use you for His glory. When God wants you alone, it will be for a good purpose. God doesn't want us to be alone so He can punish us. No, He has good plans for us. He wants us alone so He can breathe new life into us. He wants us alone so He can equip us. He wants us alone so He can give us His wisdom and direction. He wants us alone with Him because He loves us and He longs to spend time with His children. In spending time alone with our Heavenly Father, we will find purpose, we will find strength, we will find victory. Growing up, there were many times when we were asked what we would love to become when we grew up. A lot of us had different career choices at different stages while growing up. I remember I wanted to be a dad as a profession, and then a military man. I got to know about doctors, and I wanted to be one of those too. These career options changed so many times along the way. And today, I'm in none of those professions I loved earlier. I am still satisfied with my new life and the excitement of my job knows no bounds. Through those years, I started many things and ventured into many investments that never saw the light of day. There were times when I invested the last of my savings into an investment that crashed completely after just a few days. And I was crushed. My life felt over at that point. Destiny was not assured and the future looked almost non-existent. One day, I was going through my phone and I came across a video where this preacher was giving a sermon from the book of Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. This Bible passage began to open my eyes to a lot of possibilities, and I want you to see them with me. This is God speaking to you and me about his heart. You are in his thoughts. God thinks of you and has your thoughts always on his mind. That's a special place to be at the heart of God. He didn't just say he was thinking about you, but also had positive thoughts. The thoughts of God about you are to give you an expected end, not the end another person expects for you but the end you and God have preempted for your life. This means that God is aware of your current situation, regardless of its nature, because He stated that your matter is always on His mind. Your issues and challenges become solved problems when you begin to realize that God has seen your situation even before you felt it. You are on the mind of the God who can do all things and has given you the ability to do all things through him. Giving up does not exist in his realm. There's the story of a certain prophet in the Bible. The prophet Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the history of prophets in Israel. He was famous for calling fire down on a contest between the priests of Baal and himself, the prophet of God. His works were so famous that the queen of the land sought his head. This prophet, on hearing of these orders, scared for his life, went into hiding. A prophet who called fire down from heaven and wiped out a whole gathering of Baal's prophets gave up and asked God to end it and take him home. That was not the plan of God for him. And when he listened to God's plan, there was sustenance, and he would go ahead and do even more exploits in his lifetime. You do not have to give up because the times are hard or because something has ended. When you realize that your plans and purpose for life and destiny are hidden and exposed in God, you will go about your destiny building with the consciousness that you cannot give up. When you fail, don't give up. Don't stop attempting again. Chart a new path to success and put in the extra effort. I am encouraging you to say to yourself, I will not quit. I will not attempt to get better without improving my attitude and skills. And finally say, I will achieve it and I will get there. No room for quitting. In the book of Micah 7, 8, the Bible says, 
Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. This is the energy required for a winner. In the events of life and on the road to destiny and eternity, there are so many tribulations that will come up. Even our Lord Jesus Christ was not saved from the evils of this world. Over his time here on earth, Jesus was humiliated, spat on, conspired against, hunted at birth, hated by kings for no reason, and crucified for charges he knew nothing about. There's another story about a boy, Joseph. This boy, Joseph, was his father's favorite son amongst his sons. It was so clear that the hands of God were on this boy. This gave birth to jealousy towards him from his elder brothers. They were so jealous of him that they conceived a plan. Joseph took food and supplies out to his brothers in the pasture, and the eldest brothers would capture him and throw him into a well to starve to death. One of his brothers would suggest selling him off to slave traders, and they all agreed. Sold into slavery in a strange land, his new owner's wife accuses him of attempted rape, landing him in prison in a strange land. But Joseph never gave up. He never stopped believing and working his dreams into reality through his belief in God the Father. The end of the story is how he became a prominent leader in the history of the land he came from as a slave, and how his genius technology saved the world from famine. Now that is the power of a man who refuses to give up an expected end. Sometimes we find ourselves giving up on prayers when we think God's refused to turn up for us. There's a story about a pastor. He was married to his sweetheart for 25 years and ran his local church with her for 18 of those years. She was diagnosed with cancer and after prayers, treatment and all the care, she finally died. This preacher had a 20-year-old son and after the funeral of his mother, the son went to the father and asked the father why God refused to answer their prayers. He had seen his father pray for others and God answered. The preacher looked at his son and said, Son, sometimes the answer we think God will give us is not the one we get. Trusting in whatever answer he brings us is the reason we are his children and he is our God. Many people will think God has forgotten about them because of these situations. You've been praying about a particular issue for God to intervene and still the situation is lost totally. It might look like God didn't answer you. But what if the loss of the situation was the answer God gave? Our trust in His ability to carry us to term is the catalyst for the speedy completion of our challenges. Trust is the vehicle for God's covenant. You sign over the ability to do things to you and for you at His own time to God when you become His child. He does not just leave you in times of tribulation. That's never been His style of lordship. In Romans 12:12, 12, 12, he said, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. This means God knows you're passing through that situation right now, and he wants you to just be patient through it. Many times, the victory is on the other side of the struggle. Sometimes, no matter how hard we pray, it can feel like God's taken an eternity to show up and do something about our circumstances. In these moments, Satan wants to use our impatience to convince us to doubt God's faithfulness. The ways of God, many times, are not the quickest of ways. This doesn't imply that he's limited in speed because we've seen him do things that our hearts have not even conceived of. There's danger in elongated delays to prayers and prolonged failure. It takes its toll on your personality, your mind, your mental health, and most importantly, your spiritual health. It's not easy to keep doing the right thing when it feels like you're not getting anything in return. There are points you'll get in your life and sometimes the wrong options are more available and accessible than the correct ones. In a world where compromise and total systemic and societal breakdowns are commonplace, the wrong options are always near you. In the book of James 1.12, the Bible says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. 
because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. If we persevere, we will see a return on our investment. Our words and actions can have an eternal impact on the people around us. We may not know what legacy we have left on this side of eternity, but we can be confident that Jesus will bless our efforts. When you feel beaten down, when you're too tired to keep going, remember that we are promised the crown of life. Our reward in heaven is worth the trials we face on earth. In the same way, the exhilaration of completing your first marathon is worth the pain of training and running it. In all these, there's a way out. This way has been the surest of ways for all eternity. My neighbor's dog just had some puppies, and every time they play, they fall into this empty plastic kid's swimming pool behind their house. They don't know how to get out, so every time they get stuck, they'll start crying and their mother will go into the pool and use her head to help them out. Many people who have failed before have continued to fail repeatedly because they do not hold on, and the few that hold on are doing it wrong. So when they think they're standing, a little storm takes them back to square one. The best place to hold on to when every other place has failed is God. The surest and safest anchor. In 2 Samuel 22.7, the Bible says, In my distress, I called to the Lord. I called out to my God. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. This is the attitude of a winner in God. While you wait, hold on to God for sustenance. There's a level of dependence that the world cannot handle, especially in matters they do not understand. Your life and destiny are too important to rely on something untrustworthy. All my life, I've seen so many ups and downs and been tossed about like an engine dead boat in a turbulent sea. So many times there were options to do the wrong things or even just end it all. But just like the last Bible passage, I called on God and he responded. Perseverance is the only way to get a reward. The answer is at the end of the formula. The breakthrough is always at the end of the storm.